Part three, chapter thirteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter thirteen, the Reformation in France. The outlook for Protestantism in France was very favorable at the beginning. The conditions were such that no violent opposition could be expected, especially along the Seine and in the southern provinces. The seventy years' residence of the popes in Avignon had inflamed the people with a desire for a national Roman Catholic Church and a corresponding hostility to Rome. The Gallican, as against the Papal Church, had long been a hope of French kings and people. There was abroad a spirit of dissatisfaction with the existing order, and an ardent craving for religious liberty and freedom from the despotism of provincial princes. There were six principal causes which led to this desire for reformation. The remaining influence of the early Paris reformers, which was still powerful in private circles, the religious fervor of the inhabitants of the Savannah's mountains in the south, the example of the heroic Waldenses in the Vandois Alps, the example and force of the Genevan reformers with Calvin at their head, the great work of the German reformers with Wittenberg as their centre of life and force, and the literary spirit, or free tendency towards inquiry, which radiated from the university into every part of the kingdom. Nothing was more dreaded by the Romanism of France than the work which was done by the German reformers. The books of Luther found their way into France, and were translated and read extensively. By an order of the Sarbonne, they were publicly burned in the year 1521, and violent threats were made against any French person reading them. Francis I, who succeeded to the throne in 1515, was a mixed character, now half Protestant, and again thoroughly Roman Catholic. In 1535 he was lenient enough to invite Melanchthon to a conference on religious affairs in Paris a bait which that calm german was too shrewd to accept gladly replying that the elector of saxony refused permission to leave wittenberg it will add emphasis to the real meaning of this generous patronage of german scholarship when we remember that in that very year francis i burned to death from twenty to thirty of his own subjects because they were huguenots the real danger to the protestants came from a firm alliance between the authorities at rome and the french throne francis i whatever pleasant exterior he presented remained at heart a bitter advocate of oppressive measures against protestantism in his own dominions but the protestants who in france were called huguenots proceeded to the work of evangelization and organization in fifteen fifty three their first church was established and recognized and the first pastor installed in paris they also had fifteen other societies in various parts of the kingdom those in meaux angers and poitiers being among the chief but there was no cohesion between them they were simply isolated christian bodies tired of romish supremacy and in thorough sympathy with the great protestant cause in other lands however the scattered huguenots soon coalesced and in fifteen fifty nine the general synod of paris met and the gallic confession was adopted as the creed of french protestantism the huguenots possessed a martial spirit many of them had a military education and their fundamental error was their hope that by political and martial measures they might succeed in the end the royal family was divided between Huguenots and Romanists. The Bourbons were with the Huguenots, and the Guises with the Roman Catholics. The subdued opposition came to violent outbreak. The appeal was to arms, and in 1561 the land was convulsed by a civil war which lasted thirty years. Three wars were carried on, and three times a peace was patched up. The third peace, that of St. Germain, in 1570, guaranteed liberty of doctrine and public worship to the Huguenots, with the exception of the residence of the court and the city of Paris. 
Catherine de Medici became regent in 1560, her son, Charles IX, being only ten years old. She professed profound sympathy with the Huguenots, but was only playing a shrewd game of deception. She was waiting for an opportunity to deal destruction on every side. The increase of Protestantism at this time was remarkably rapid. The Synod in 1559 had not only adopted a confession, which bore every mark of Calvin's hand, but had also thoroughly organized a Protestant church, with a provision for provincial synods throughout the kingdom, and a complete system of church discipline and liturgical order. When the war began in 1561, there were, according to Beza, 400,000 Huguenots throughout France, and Condé's list of their churches, presented as an exhibit to Catherine de' Medici, comprised 2,150 names. They were distributed chiefly through the south and west. Normandy also possessed many of their societies, but in the north the Huguenots were less represented. It was arranged by Catherine that the semblance of a thorough reconciliation between the Protestants and the Roman Catholics should take place. Charles's sister was to marry Henry of Navarre, the leader of the Huguenots. Brilliant festivities were arranged, and the whole land was alive with new joy that, at last, the Huguenots and Roman Catholics could live henceforth in peace, and each worship with equal rights before the law. The marriage was celebrated August 18, 1572, but on the night of the 24th, a bell in the palace belfry gave the signal for general slaughter. This was the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve. The Huguenot chiefs were all in Paris, and their whereabouts was known. Admiral Coligny, an intrepid warrior and a firm Huguenot, was murdered in cold blood and cast out of the window into the stone court below. For seven days and nights the streets ran with Protestant blood. Outside of Paris the massacre was sudden and overwhelming. The Loire and the Rhone ran red and thick with the blood and bodies of victims. The cities of Meaux, Orléans, Bourget, Lyon, Rouen, Toulouse, and Bordeaux were centres of the persecution. Not less than thirty thousand Huguenots fell beneath flame and sword. The pretext for the universal murder was that Coligny had concerted a secret conspiracy against the crown. There is not, and never was, a vestige of authority for even the suspicion of such a thing. At Rome there was great rejoicing over the bloodshed. Pope Gregory ordered the ringing of the bells of the city, and a special medal to be struck in honor of his triumph. The Huguenots were not willing, even yet, to surrender. They had lost immense numbers, but were eager to renew the conflict. The struggle began again, and in 1576 the Peace of Boleo guaranteed the Huguenots once more the liberty of worship and doctrine. Henry of Navarre ascended the throne in 1589 as Henry IV. He renounced his Protestantism as the price of his crown, but by the Edict of Nantes in 1598, he gave full liberty to the Huguenots to worship in places where they had established services, and to stand equal with Roman Catholics before the law. Protestants now increased very rapidly. Henry IV granted them personal safety and the right of worship in 150 places throughout the kingdom, the chief of which were Bordeaux, Poitiers, and Montpellier. By the year 1628 they possessed 688 churches, and by 1637 these had grown to 720. For nearly a century they enjoyed comparative peace, and rapidly multiplied in every department of ecclesiastical prosperity. When Louis the Fourteenth came to the throne, he strongly opposed them. No wrong was spared to make France an unwelcome home. There were at this time about two million Huguenots throughout the country, though at one time they had numbered at least one-third the entire population of the country. In the quarter of a century preceding 1685, not less than 520 of their churches were destroyed. They were permitted to leave the country, 
and the exile began in 1666. It continued not less than half a century, during which time a low estimate of the number of Huguenots who forsook France places it at one million. But still many remained, and, to give a finishing stroke to them, the Edict of Nantes was revoked in the year 1685. This act destroyed the last vestige of civil and religious rights now remaining to the Huguenots. There were still about one thousand of their pastors, and of those one hundred were sent to the galleys or put to death, six hundred fled the country, and the other three hundred disappeared in unaccountable ways. For a century Protestantism was almost blotted out of the country. Only at the close of the eighteenth century was there a comparative revival of the old Protestant spirit. End of chapter 13